On we go to chapter 24, and in this chapter we're going to be talking about eggs. Just like last chapter, this one will be, will be broken down into three different sections. We'll start off by looking at the nutritional and chemical composition of eggs. We'll talk about what happens when we cook with eggs and what the applications of egg cooking are. And then finally, we'll look at food safety and eggs. All eggs are not created equally. So be able to identify the characteristics of a high quality egg and discern the differences between a high and low quality egg. Be able to explain the nutritional benefits and risks, if there are any, of eggs. Understand the process of coagulation. We talked about what this is in milk. It's still pretty much the same thing, but with eggs, it does have a few different applications. So correlate the effect of coagulation of eggs with the structure of baked goods. Identify any other major roles of eggs in the baking process. And finally, there are some very serious foodborne illnesses associated with eggs. One that we're going to specifically hone in on, know what this is and know what you can do and what food service establishments and farmers and food production systems do to prevent these foodborne illnesses and their associated risks. In this first section, we are going to crack open the egg and look at the chemical composition of eggs, talk about what makes a high quality versus a low quality egg, and then look at some nutrition considerations related to eggs. And you might be surprised about what we talk about when we focus on cholesterol. When you think of an egg, usually you just think of the egg yolk, the egg white, and the shell. What's really nice about this picture is it shows some of the connecting structures that are present to make sure that this egg shell and the egg, the egg's in, internal parts stay together and stay very stable. And so what we have, you see there's a twisty line on top of the yolk and below the oak, yolk and coming along the sides of this. This is known as the chalaza. And this keeps the oak suspended and in place. There are also some membranes these separate different parts of the egg, so this also helps to keep the yolk separate. It also helps to keep the egg white separate and away from the, the shell. The egg white is the clear part of the egg that turns white when it is cooked. It's designed to surround and protect the egg yolk from any damage. It's very simple. This mainly contains protein. There's maybe a little bit of fat, a little bit of carbohydrates, but just know that the egg white contains quite a bit of protein. The egg yolk, it's the central yellow part of the egg, and this is actually a very direct source of nutrients before, for a baby bird before it hatches. As a result, it also happens to be a very high in many nutrients that are beneficial for people and this actually does include fat and cholesterol. If you are cooking and eating an egg, you want an egg that's of a very high quality, that tastes really good, that's very fresh. What does this mean? High quality eggs, they have thick egg whites. They have a very rounded yolk. The chalaze, which, sep which holds the egg yolk in place, is very strong. And on the top of the egg, there's a very small air cell. As eggs get older, the egg whites become thinner. The yolk is a little bit flatter. The chalaze that are connecting that yolk, they become a bit weaker, and that air cell gets much larger. So how do we go through and figure out whether or not we're getting a high quality egg? Fortunately, we do not have to do this. Food manufacturers do it for us through a process known as candling. They put a light up to the egg and that light is able to look inside that egg and see that internal structure and determine whether or not it's a higher or lower quality egg. 
And there's not a person that's sitting in a room that has to go through each individual egg. There are very large and highly efficient, highly sophisticated machines that can look at very large quantities of eggs at once and make sure that the eggs, the very large quantities of them fall under certain classifications. So it'll look at a lot of eggs and the eggs that meet certain criteria will be put into different classifications, whether that be double A, A, or B. And when you go to the grocery store, the eggs that are double A are of the highest quality. The eggs that are B, they're still okay. You can still eat them, but they're going to be of a lower quality than the double A eggs. So this slide shows higher versus lower quality eggs. Again, the double A is the highest quality. The B is the lowest quality that's sold. Again, B is still going to give you a good egg, but just not the same quality that you get from a double A egg. And you can see in the B grade, there's a much larger air cell that's formed. You can also see that the structure, the yolk is definitely lower in the B grade. The white is definitely lower. The overall structure is much weaker in the grade B egg compared to the A and double A egg. When most people think of eggs and their nutritional value, they think of two different things. They think of protein and they think of cholesterol. Well, the story is a little bit deeper than that. Not all of the egg has cholesterol. Not all of it is a great source of protein. The egg's nutritional components can only be divided into two different sections, the yolk and the egg white. Egg whites basically are just protein. Really, for, for what we need to know, egg whites are just protein. Yolks, these have fat in them. They have saturated fat and they have cholesterol. They have some protein, but the cholesterol is only going to be found in the yolk. Now the yolks, even though they have a lot of cholesterol, they still have some other very beneficial nutrients in, in them. They have minerals such as selenium, phosphorus, iron, zinc, and calcium. And then B vitamins such as thiamine, folate, and vitamin B12. And then fat-soluble vitamins such as vitamin A, D, E, and K. And then the egg whites, they have vitamins such as riboflavin, and folate, and they also have minerals such as selenium, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and potassium. When somebody has a heart attack, they have a heart attack because the blood stops flowing. And it stops flowing because there's a blockage that occurs in the veins or the arteries. And so you can see what's going on here in that very in that picture on the right, on the very top picture, you have an artery with very normal and healthy blood flow. In the middle picture, you have one that has seen some type of inflammation. So there's been some problem that's occurred there. And as a result, there's been plaque or cholesterol deposits that have formed around that to heal that, which is the body thinks it's a good thing. And in some ways it is a good thing because it is part of the healing process, but when inflammation continues to occur, that plaque site is going to continue to rupture and more of the particles that cause the plaque to develop, such as the cholesterol, is going to build up even higher and higher until there is a complete blockage. When there's a complete blockage, that's when you have a heart attack. So the question that I'm asking you is which of the following is most likely to reduce the bad blood cholesterol that causes this type of plaque development? So do you think that would be lowering saturated fat, lowering cholesterol intake, eating more soluble fiber, or reducing the processed sugar intake? If you said lowering saturated fat or lowering cholesterol, you are actually wrong. The answer is increasing your soluble fiber intake. And soluble fiber, it's mainly found in fruits and vegetables. And this is the most effective at reducing blood cholesterol 
and preventing that plaque from developing and forming to the point where you have that blockage. It's pretty amazing, but lowering your cholesterol and lowering your saturated fat, which you would think would be the most direct causes of high blood cholesterol, are actually not that effective at lowering your blood cholesterol. So in the past, nutrition recommendations said to keep fat, keep saturated fat, and keep cholesterol low. Now they're not saying that quite as much. These nutrients don't have that same effect, and there's lots of foods that have cholesterol in them and saturated fat in them that are very, very healthy. As long as we eat those foods in balance with plenty of fruits and vegetables, we'll be okay. So remember, high soluble fiber intake through fruits and vegetables is most likely to reduce the bad blood cholesterol. For the second section, we're going to talk about the science of cooking eggs. And we're going to mainly be looking at three principles for this, coagulation, emulsification, and foaming. And coagulation and foaming, we talked about in the last PowerPoint, and we've talked about emulsification as well. So a lot of this should be reviewed. So try to pick up on some similar concepts between these three different topics. Coagulation is the thickening of proteins, and for eggs, this is going to occur through cooking. Coagulation of proteins does not just apply to eggs. Coagulation of meats is very common, so when you have a raw meat product and you cook it, it's going to get much thicker, and it's going to be more dense and more compact. You have a different structure when you, have, when you cook raw meat, and that is coagulation. When blood clots, when it dries up, that is also an example of coagulation. So for eggs, we're talking about when you go from the raw structure to the cooked structure, that process is coagulation. So the liquids are becoming a solid mass. Now, acids and salts are going to increase the rate of coagulation. So if we add salts to eggs when we're cooking them, that's going to ca cause coagulation to occur much quicker. If we were at, to add sugar to eggs, that's going to slow down coagulation and make it more difficult to occur, which may happen when we are foaming eggs or creating some type of baked good that uses eggs and also quite a bit of sugar. Now, emulsion, or coagulation, this signifies that the egg is fully cooked, which is very important for food safety. And a coagulated egg, this is going to play a pretty significant role in the structure of baked products. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. Take a look at this slide. All of the foods in this slide use eggs. Now, eggs are used for multiple functions. But the structure of each of these foods, being able to keep them as tight and as solid as they are, this is largely due to the fact that eggs are used in their processing. So when eggs are cooked, they're mixed in with the dough and they're spread out. And this dough, when it's cooked, it's going to solidify. Now, the heating that's occurring when the dough is cooked is also causing the solidification or the coagulation of the eggs. So the eggs are becoming a tougher structure and they are somewhat connected. They're loosely connected, but not quite as connected as they are in a regular egg product. But this connection is still going to provide some structure to that entire big product. So it's more likely to stay intact providing structure and stabilization. With an emulsion, you have a mixture of two liquids that do not normally mix. Now, when you add an emulsifying agent, what this does is it causes these ingredients to mix together and actually uniformly distribute within one another. And this occurs because that emulsifying agent is able to hold each of these two ingredients. 
So it holds these ingredients. So even though these ingredients are next to molecules that they do not like, they're still going to be stuck in that emulsifying agent, which in this case is eggs, that causes them to be stable. And in eggs, there's a chemical known as lecithin, which is found in the egg yolk, that is specifically responsible for this. Go back a few chapters to when we talked about cakes and cookies. Remember the foam cakes. To create the foam cakes, we had to create an actual foam structure, and we did this through beating of egg whites. And what that does, what the beating of egg whites does, it allows air to be incorporated into the egg. Air is a form of a gas, and so when gas is mixed within beaded eggs, that's going to cause some type of expansion. So this expansion is going to make the eggs a little bit fluffier, a little bit lighter, and so when they're added to a product such as a cake, that cake is going to be a little bit lighter and a little bit fluffier as well. And now when the eggs coagulate, they do so with more air in them. So they're still going to solidify, but they're still going to have that gas in them that causes that separation. And having that gas inside of the foam cakes causes a very foamy, spongy, but still airy structure that's also very stable. And finally, we will talk about eggs and food safety. There is one major foodborne illness associated with improper handling of eggs. So we'll focus on that. We'll talk about what is done at the plant to process eggs and make sure that they are safe. And then we'll talk about what you can do in the kitchen to handle and store eggs so that they are going to be safe for your consumption. Salmonella is the disease that is associated with eggs. Now, salmonella is found in eggs. It can be found in fruit, vegetables, undercooked bread products, unpasteurized dairy, and various meats. Salmonella is caused by leaving foods unrefrigerated, leaving foods out at warm temperatures, which is very common at picnics, not washing your hands and then processing of food and then touching contaminated surfaces. Also, if you're working with a food that's uncooked like an egg, and then you use um, a mixing bowl or a cutting board or a utensil that's come into contact with that egg and you let that touch ready to eat food, that can cause those other foods, maybe even if they're fruits and vegetables that are not susceptible to, to salmonella, it can cause them to be contaminated with salmonella. So you can eat those foods and still get salmonella from a food like an egg. Now the symptoms of salmonella are largely related to digestion complications. Um, they present themselves through severe cramping, severe diarrhea and fever. And in very severe cases, salmonella can lead to death. Now, salmonella can be difficult to track and trace back to a certain food because it takes quite a bit of time for that to cause symptoms in our body. So it could take, on, on a shorter end, it could take 12 hours or a half day to present itself, or it could take up to three days or 72 hours to present itself. So it'd be very difficult to trace it back to a specific meal or a specific food. This slide highlights the process of salmonella infection in a little bit greater of detail. So you start off by eating a food that or drink that's contaminated with salmonella and the food is going to travel throughout your digestive system and go into your small intestine. Now, the salmonella is going to adhere to the intestinal wall and from there it causes the complications that you're familiar with the severe abdominal cramping the severe diarrhea some other complications that can occur are nausea vomiting and fever and this usually lasts between a couple days to an entire week and people 
that have immune systems that are not fully development, developed or immune systems that may be compromised are more at risk for very severe complications from the salmonella infection. Why eggs? Why are eggs so susceptible to salmonella? Well, animal products in general are incredibly susceptible to foodborne illness. For eggs specifically, the salmonella can grow inside and outside of the eggs. Eggs also have a very high moisture content and bacteria grows very well in moisture. And then also, birds are animals and they don't just stand still in a, in a box and not come into contact with anything else. They eat foods and they move around in their pens with other birds. So the food that they may eat could be contaminated or they even worse, they could come into contact with their own feces or the feces of other birds and somehow digest this and get this into their system. To prevent contamination from occurring, eggs are processed very quickly. So as soon as the eggs are laid from a chicken or from a bird, they are cooled very rapidly. So they reach relatively safe temperatures for about 45 degrees in about 90 seconds. So they're cooled very, very, very quickly. And then they're also very commonly pasteurized. So pasteurized that involves killing the bacteria. And they do this by putting the eggs in hot water for a short period of time. And there's also a relatively new process that most companies use. And this is ionization radiation that kills the salmonella. When you buy a package of eggs, you can be sure that you're buying a pretty safe product, but eggs are still very susceptible to contamination. So when you take those eggs home, you still have to be very careful with those eggs because bacteria can grow through improper handling of those eggs. So what can you do? Keep the eggs refrigerated and outside of the temperature danger zone for as long as possible. So as long as you keep foods in the refrigerator, which would be between 33 and 40 degrees, the eggs are going to be fine for at least for some period of time. But if they're left out at room temperature or in the danger zone, which is 40 to 140 degrees, that is when bacteria can grow and multiply in the eggs. And if they're left out for more than four hours, the bacteria can reach dangerous levels. Anytime you go to the bathroom and you're preparing eggs, make sure that you wash your hands. Cook the eggs thoroughly. Even if eggs are contaminated when they're raw, if you cook them thoroughly, you're going to be killing most, if not all of the bacteria, of the harmful bacteria in the eggs. Keep all utensils, cookware, bowls, containers, and surfaces that come into contact with the egg clean because all of these are very easy methods and sources of transfer of harmful microorganisms to the egg. And then finally, avoid cross-contamination of the raw eggs with ready-to-eat foods. So if you've cooked some vegetables and they come into contact with the raw eggs, even if they're, if they're, raw, if they're raw vegetables and you've chopped them up already, and they somehow come into contact with those raw eggs, they need to be thrown out. Because if the raw eggs are carrying any type of microorganism, like salmonella, that can cause those fruits and vegetables to catch that. And then when you eat the fruits and vegetables, even if you completely cook and kill all the bad bacteria in the eggs, the fruits and vegetables that are contaminated can still cause those same complications. This slide provides an overview of the handling techniques that food production companies use to ensure that eggs are safe and reminds you of a few things that you can do in the kitchen to make sure that the eggs that you put into your system are also safe. That is all for this week. There is a homework assignment that is on D2L for chapters 23 and 24. 
please remember that there is a new date for exam three, which is posted on your syllabus. That's all for now. Have a great week.